Um, well, first, uh, I want to thank Nate was so generous today in taking us around. And uh, I have to say, Millen's fan at that beautiful Beck house, which uh, I've admired. I knew Philip Johnson. And I'd like to introduce two guests from New York, Reed Morrison, who I collaborated with and went to Harvard with and uh, worked for Philip Johnson, actually. And art historian Amy Troyan came from New York to be join us tonight. And um, how honored I am to be here. I have too many slides, and I haven't written enough. So uh, I'm going to try to speed through them after I figure this out. But um, we're architects, and uh, I graduated Harvard and came to New York with the hopes of practicing big time architecture and started at Skid Rowings in Merrill. And about eight months into it, 90 of us were fired because of, uh, and at $12,000 a year. Uh, and we kind of scratched our heads, what could we do? So we were designing stair cores and kind of fairly detached things, and then all the fantasies of big time architecture kind of had to be put aside momentarily, and then we started from scratch in doing bathrooms and kitchens and building our way up through competitions and so forth to do more interesting, formidable work. But it was the early seeds at school that even though I was kind of hacking around a lot because I was a pre-med student who failed biochemistry and <laughs> I think I wanted to be a gynecologist for some reason. Because, you know, they said you had to be a professional. When I said, I want to be an architect, my dad said, God, you know, if you work for the classes, you're going to eat with the masses. You better, you better rethink this thing. But I, I do remember those art history courses that planted all those seeds and those quotes by those great artists that rang in my ears. Uh, and it, I realized that those early seeds that were planted permeated the work that you're about to see whether it was a product, uh, a room, uh, a house, a, a plan, an urban plan. It was Errol Saarinen, who I greatly respect, who said, always design a thing by considering it in its next larger context. A chair in a room, a room in a house, a house in an environment, and an environment in a city. And then Leonardo da Vinci, in one of my Ackerman art history courses, he said, back then, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. And Corbusier, in another course, I had Corbusier's assistant at Harvard. Uh, space and light and order, those are the things that men need just as much as they need bread or a place to sleep. And then, of course, I had courses with Louis Kahn. He said, a great building must begin with the immeasurable, must go through measurable means when it's being designed, and in the end, must be immeasurable. So those kind of stuck in my head. And, and no matter what the scale of the project was, those seem to be the principles that kind of guided me through the integration of architecture, interior, landscape, and try to seamlessly integrate the things so you could transcend enclosure and become an art form. This first project, I think I'm plugged in here. I'm doing this one, yeah. This is an interesting uh, task here. Uh, Andre Balaz, who's a developer of 40 Mercer Street, came to us and said, we, said, we want you to collaborate with um, a great architect, uh, and I thought, God, this guy, he doesn't need any collaboration. It was Jean Nouvel, and uh, what does he need us for? So I said, let Jean Nouvel do this building. You don't really need to have another architect work with him. He has a vision. And the uh, real estate people decided they were going to dictate what the penthouse was going to be. So this penthouse of 40 Mercer was delivered as a white box. They didn't let Jean Nouvel do it. And ironically, that owner came to us when the building was complete and said, would you design this duplex space? And as we finished the project and moved the client in, the elevator opened and John Nouvel appeared at the door. <laughs> and he said, I wanted to see what you did with my building. <laughs> so we showed him what he, and he hugged and kissed me. I have a wonderful picture. He said, you did it better than I could. So, I felt sort of Marie Chevalier there a little bit. Uh, in any case, this is the plan to do the pointer thing here. And we created a kind of uh, functional two-story bar that occurs through this place. And this has a glass ceiling. You heard about that politically, but this actually has a glass ceiling. And um, oops, I don't think my thing is working here. I'm going to do this manually then. OK. This is not working either. There we go. OK. Uh, so this 
see if this thing works. This, I gotta go fast because I've only got like 15 minutes. And all right. This is a two story uh, kind of functional element that goes up two stories. And that is on a pneumatic lift that whole window wall parts to make the place an outdoor balcony. So the idea was to create through the lighting, for example, the integration of all the elements, the street pattern that the cacophony of noise and street lights make in the ceiling and have this rise above in the two-story space and use the reflections in the glass curtain wall that John did, we, we did everything inside, to inform the animation of the space. There you can see back in the other view. I don't know what. Ooh. Mr. Techman, I don't think this thing is working. Um, here you can see we, we created in this two-story element, since there was a blue uh, curtain wall a glass component, we used the almost theater of Endosberg and de Steel methods of, uh, I remember Mondrian did a painting called Boogie Woogie Bugle about the New York City traffic. So we kind of uh, suspended elements that were complementary colors to the glass to neutralize the color and create a kind of sun that was up above. This is the two-story element in the two-story space. The HVAC is hidden in that balcony that comes over there, over the city. And then this rug is designed like the great thing about Alto and Corbu and everybody, they used all the tools of design to reinforce the space. So having started so humbly in little tiny spaces and we got bigger, we never lost the respect for integrating the environment. So this rug, for example, is woven in the direction of a sphere. So it's like you're looking on top of the world. These are Arnie Gockerson chairs. And it's almost like a tulip budding around the Keir home table and the uh, Lewis Poulsen light with a, a lawn rug there. That's the second story, the bedroom area. And um, this is the opposite kind of residence. This was about archaeology, this residence. This residence belonged to David Rockefeller and uh, someone named Bookhance. And that's all new in there, but there was a lot of important historical New York history there, and we didn't want to jettison it, so we rearranged the history and moved it to make it vital and pertinent uh, to today. So if you look at the plan here, we... Oop, I don't think I can go backwards or forwards here. Uh, can I get this thing to work, Mr. Techman? The buttons aren't working here. Just jiggle, jiggle, jiggle. <laughs> All right. Jiggling has gotten me a lot of places before. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out and jiggle. Here we go. There's no signal. Oh, there we go. Is that working? No, not working. Okay. I, it's not working on the computer or... Uh, this is a tripartite rug, which was used the ornament of the building, um, the park, and a, a kind of botany to create a triptych in the floor that organized the space. You can see the sun is in the rug there, and the sun sets in the east, and that's an outdoor solarium uh, where the sun also, so it's like the, the mirror and the, and the rug element kind of follow the sun as they inform the space. And this is the acanthus leaf that appears on the cornice of the building. I don't think any of this is functioning right now. We incorporated the arches of the building and did a landscape plan. Um, we used the Gothic components of the fireplace and integrated them in, into the rug there. But we recycled pieces of this apartment into different places. We used the old, that's the old St. Charles kitchen that was a butler's pantry that's been moved to recycle. So that even the paneling, everything was moved to give a kind of, if you want to call it, sustainability in a way by bringing the past forward. That paneling was in the living room, it was moved into the bedroom, kind of cake frosting. And this is a project uh, 
I worked on with Reed Morrison, architect, very talented man I went to school with who's right here. This is a project in, in North Sea in Long Island, and it's a, a compound. Uh, you can see here, it's the water, Davis Creek and Peconic Bay are here, and the streets of North Sea are here. So to acknowledge the geometry of the streets, these two buildings are set up on the geometry of the streets. But then a boardwalk happens, and the shift to acknowledge the water happens on an angle, and everything is shifted to acknowledge the new angle of the water. So the building is pulled apart, the pool is pulled, pulled apart, and everything kind of uh, west of the boardwalk, north of the boardwalk, is on different geometry. See the plan. And the building is conceived, it's a concrete structure that has a wood curtain wall that's kind of a quilt, and the rectangle is broken open like an egg is broken open and shifted, and it's seen together by a glass channel wedge, which lets the light into the building. That's the compound from the front acknowledging the street. That transitional building, that's a, a gable that's fully exposed, semi-engaged and fully enclosed, which is the zoning transition from the street up. And this acknowledges the uh, kind of local architecture, that being like a drawbridge or a freshman strand and the gables of the adjacent farms and agrarian structures. There you can see the curtain wall, which is a wood quilt, literally weaving culturally and weaving like a, a cabinet, uh, the texture of history and construction together. It's like a giant doorstop. This is the um, wedge side. So when the building is split apart with the boardwalk, the wedge informs uh, the change in geometry and brings light into the space. And it was interesting in this building was also the collection of furniture because the collection of furniture is almost a kind of microcosm of what's happening in the building. It's works by Le Corbusier and Charlotte Perrien and uh, uh, Jean Prouvé and uh, Charles Eames and Gio Ponti and all the people that we were interested in studying kind of is examined both as an object and, a, and, and in a place in a building to interact with the structure. That's a, a custom Alto series for a sculpture from Finland, but the integration of the material with this, this is eucalyptus wood. And the eucalyptus wood is a farm material that's laid up horizontally like shiplap, but its warmth is neutralized by the coolness of the concrete and then is balanced by the selection of furnishings, Matthias Bengston's sediment chair and Oliver Alto's commission there. This is in the core of the building where the mechanical things are. It's uh, enclosed by a wood element, but once you penetrate that, it's white, and it's two stories for the infrastructure. There's the staircase and poured concrete going up, and the uh, guest side of the building, which is the front side of the building, the master bedroom, the bathroom. Actually, we took a picture of the trees with no leaves in the winter on that elevation and thought, God, if we could if we could be informed by that beautiful photo photograph of branch work in stone, that that would be a nice thing. So in the summer, it's beautiful. But in the winter, it almost looks like the shadows of the trees occur in the bath. Uh, this is a, a wonderful bedroom that's on that front geometry. But all the furnishings in here are by Le Corbusier from his various dormitories. So this is an homage to one of the people we studied. And that's the boardwalk link to the gabled building, which makes its transition from traditional to a more modernist vocabulary. And as it turns the corner, it foreshadows the corner on the main building. I mean, this is a little kooky, but even all this stuff is the Bauhaus cover of the Bauhaus book, the forms and stuff. 
land of the guest house. And then this was a lot of fun. Masked in that structure to mask the step down of the gables, we did a, a proscenium, which you can't tell that the, the roof starts to shrink there. So the proscenium grabs the tallest dimension. It frames the, the pool house bedroom, which is kind of like a tree house. So once you penetrate the proscenium, everything in there is twine and paper and of the tree. I remember when this was um, being finished, my neighbor came over with his five-year-old, and the kid walked in here, and he said, Daddy, can I have my birthday party here? <laughs> and I thought, that's the best compliment I ever had. <laughs> that's upstairs, the paper, twine, all the things made from the tree, because you're in the tree. This is a, a duplex penthouse for a developer in New York. Long, skinny space, again, exploring uh, how to kind of articulate a two-story element in a very skinny space. And here you can see it's expressed in the ceiling and in the staircase. So the stair had to become a sculpture element uh, that was uh, embraced by the public space and not something to be hidden. So it's very carefully cantilevered with the metal posts off of there to form a sculptural element. And I have to say, I think every project, you try to find what the problem is, and then you try to solve the problem. And it must be in a diagram. It has to be seemingly inevitable and very simple. And then you go to all this sweat to make it look like nothing happened. And that's really the goal of every project, that it looks like nothing happened. But this is a case where a lot happened. This was Sting's house in London. And we were trying to do uh, an excavation in addition. It was a number one listed building, and it started to fall apart. So we had to put stilts on the building. This was on um, St. James Park, Queen Anne's Gate. And we had to jack this whole building up. And then we erected this structure and made a two-level garden. Uh, and, and, and digging into their heritage of kilts and, and tartum, uh, I don't know if anybody knows the difference between a plaid and a tartan. Is it tartan? Yeah, tartan. Yeah, tartan, 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 tartan. Um, a plaid is, a, is not a square, and a tartan is made of squares. I learned that just from understanding that. So we, we dug into that in the, using the materials of the building as components to create our own tartan plaid and dig into their cultural history. This building was designed in about 1720. Oh, then we got to do some planes. We've done about four planes, work with Gulfstream and Bombardier. That was really interesting, um, exploring things in flight, weight, engineering. I have to say, I, as much as I love doing them, I don't like getting on them with the clients, though because you feel like you're not allowed to sleep because you're a prisoner, you know, like, <laughs> they got to sleep first, they have to go to the bathroom first, so I'd rather take the commercial plane and meet them. <laughs> then we worked, uh, we won a competition to do a big ship in Germany, in Poppenburg, Germany, which was a long haul. It was um, a flight to Amsterdam, which would land at 6 a.m., a four-hour drive to Poppenburg, and then a meeting, and I did it sometimes in 24 hours where I would get back on a plane at night. But this took, uh, it started out as one piece of steel that was about four feet square, and then it came up two blocks long up the Hudson River for its christening at one point, which was a real thrill. That's actually um, the Flatiron Building. This was called the Manhattan Restaurant, and that's the back of the ship. And so at night, there's nothing to look at, so these drop down, and in the daytime, this followed the wake of the, of the ship itself. We used components of waves and fish going in and out of the sea, and we exposed how the ship was put together to create uh, the division of space and detail. We looked at George Brock's paintings. These are kind of birds, and then El Morocco's print to understand the glamour of uh, those, those days and what, what, what could make people feel like they wanted to get dressed up and make that big entrance. This was, we worked with Saul Lewitt on a champagne bar there. And then this was with Herzog de Mueron, 56 Leonard Street. 
uh, we worked with them on this project, and they said to me, uh, this is a little scary, this is the 60th floor near the World Trade Center. And I thought, who's going to want to live there? going to think of the planes and everything going in there. They said, well, will you do a rendering for us? So I did this indoor-outdoor garden, you see, that goes through that makes you feel safe. And this is the deconstruction of the building in their promo. And then we made a secret garden in which all these very expensive things inhabit. And it seemed to work because they sold this in the floor below for $90 million. It was shocking. There's the sales office. Um, so down to the rug even, we, we looked at the kind of pivoting that happens in the building. And this was a, a sales office we did uh, in which things to pivot like the building does itself. We worked in both of Richard Meyer's buildings, the um, uh, Charles Street building, the, the, the two that he did over there. And it was interesting because this one was on the fifth floor, so we felt this belonged to the ground. And then we did one in the smaller building on the tall floor, which we thought belonged to the river. So they had very different solutions. Uh, this one, we explored the piers. And you can see this rug kind of transitions from as if water is kind of seeping up through here. And it incorporates the columns. And it creates a circular apse in the floor there. And the Martin Zekele tables are like the piers themselves with the vertical. And this was an industrial duplex, two apartments at the penthouse of the Prasada, on which we created a public, public entrance think tank space and a private entry of bedrooms and a gallery that connects to the two. And it has a mezzanine and a rooftop space as well. This is 80% new in here, but we salvaged the historical pieces because we didn't want to lose the thread that brought those great industrial spaces together, so we, we incorporated them into the design. It's the gallery space linking the two, mezzanine overlooking everything, and then the rooftop. Then we won the commission to do Ralph Lawrence corporate headquarters at 650 Madison Avenue. And you know, it's funny that he chose people that are modernists to do all that stuff. But um, it was OK. Uh, we, we, were, we weren't allowed to use any of the architect talk during the meetings. We got scolded for talking about concepts. We had to talk about movies and Cary Grant and stuff like that. So we, I remember saying to Peter, my late partner, uh, that we had to do high concept, but we had to talk movies. So we created this kind of reading room atrium space in which it's all chocolate. And as you move away from chocolate, it turns to chocolate and vanilla. And when you get deeper into the studios and the company, it goes to vanilla and caramel, and then it goes to all white. So you get this ratcheted up world of Ralph Lauren in the epicenter as a club in a two-story space. And then it disseminates, and the uh, uh, studios have the same architecture, but they start to get lighter and whiter. And it gets more real as you move to the window wall into everyday work. That's uh, moving out into the studio spaces. We created all the millwork systems, the storage systems. That's, um, one, of the core, that's one of the typical studios. So they each had their communal spaces, and then they had private offices around it. That was in 1995, actually. Um, this was a compound up on the Hudson in Rhinebeck. We were informed by the Frederick Church paintings. And that's actually a new building. And we moved a series of barns together to make a homestead up there and built that dam and collected all the buildings that were scattered about the property and made a kind of central space of them, recycling some of the timbers using beadboard and elements that were friendly to the Rhinebeck aesthetic. And the various barn structures. And there's the cantilevered waterfall.
I have to say, this is a fake picture. I mean, it's a real picture, but one of the magazines was photographing it, so I placed every leaf there. <laughs> it looks like they're just blowing around, but it's not blowing in the wind. <laughs> And um, for the same owner, we did a Greek revival townhouse in New York City. And I wouldn't call it an intervention, or I wouldn't call it a restoration. It kind of took the elements, the soul of the building, and explored how it could be relevant today. And ironically, I was at the Dan Kiley um, Landscape Project today. And what was the name of that building? Fountain Place. Yeah, not the Fountain Blue, the Fountain Place, right. And uh, we work with Dan. This is his last project on this landscape. And it was a, uh, to dematerialize the transition down to a low, lower level, we created a water wall. So both sound and volume and shadow capture space and light to a lower space with a glass terrace here and a bridge that goes across. That's a carved water fountain for the doggies. And the Jean-Michel Frank furniture is like Brassai photos that are, it's a sundial uh, in, in the pavement. So that was Dan's, one of his last projects. And that's under the brownstone entry where there was no light. We went for the kind of jungle red dining room. This is the restorative part uh, with all custom furnishings and curated objects in it. Christopher Wool painting. The old chandelier. This is a, uh, I mean the old rosette with a, with a contemporary chandelier and some of the details were restored. There you see the four-story glass slice that happens in the building, living very comfortably next to the traditional ornament. And then where we did the addition to the building, uh, since to be honest, we did a modernist stair. So the new part of the building looks very different than the old part of the building, and you understand when you're in the different parts. There's the transition from the traditional stair to the addition. And the addition has a different vocabulary. Then we got to work with um, Gannon Benjamin up in Martha's Vineyard on a sailboat, which was really fun to work. All wood and bronze with the sailmakers. And uh, this is called Juno. If anyone's in St. Bart's for Christmas, you can see it in the uh, harbor there. It's a big cabinet, an engineered cabinet, not unlike a ship in a different way. This one swims, the other one flies. And this is a compound out on Long Island. Um, it's 42 acres on Wainscott Pond and the Atlantic Ocean. And it's, uh, it's really six buildings together. I really respected the owner for breaking the scale up because you get McMansions out there and um, sometimes big isn't better. So we broke the scale up for the owner's couple of bedrooms and kitchen and dining here, a guest building here, a gym building, and a triple dining pavilion, all centered around a courtyard. It's the plan of the building. The building was supposed to feel almost like a bulkhead that sat up against the water, a kind of non-building agrarian structure in the field of flowers. And ironically, this passed the Historic Review Board in one meeting. We were very pleasantly surprised um, because they liked that it. it was all wood. And it was, it was actually in the tradition of those case houses, the utopian houses of Peter Blake and so forth. And we were very true. And uh, it's, it sits very calmly and beautifully in its context. That's the dining pavilion. Um, they have a law there that says that an accessory building can only be uh, 600 square feet, but you can have another one five feet away. <laughs> so we did three of them, like a choo-choo train there. And then we made a little canopy you know, that they don't see when you file it. <laughs> so that makes them all together, because the, the owner said, I want to have dinner for 120 people. So when you open up the three pavilions, you can actually do that. But it uses all the components of the indigenous architecture, barn doors, simple materials. There's the relationship of one to the other and the glimpses through the property to the ocean, corn cribs. That's the um, roof on the third one. 
So the building dematerializes. By the time you get to the third one, it's really just the frame with covered, and those are the canopies illegally connecting the three. It's the guest building. And then um, we, we started to get so into all this stuff we were doing that we, weren't, we liked Speakman fittings, but they were kind of cheap. They're Philip Johnson's favorite. And Waterworks came to us, and, and Peter was very interested in how things work, not just how they look. So this was a line we created. Ironically, we created this about 12 years ago, and Waterworks was, I hope nobody from Waterworks is here, was too chicken because they thought they were abandoning their traditional base. So this was called 0.25, and it was generated by a radius of 0.25. And so water never puddled. You see, that's a 0.25 radius, 0.25 radius. And 0.25 was the radius, ironically, that Corbusier used on his stencil letters so he wouldn't break a pencil. So he'd write in his things, it was always slightly curved. So we then invented a, um, a valve that could, is patented that could go below the surface of the deck and free the deck up because Arnie Jakobsen with Vola had cleaned up the whole thing, but that looked a little Gestapo-like, you know, with just a hole in the wall and mist coming out. And uh, Speakman was a little cheap, so we thought, okay, let's do something because you touch your fittings as, as much as you touch anything every day. You know, you turn the water on, you flush the toilet, you go in the shower. So if we can make this a gentle experience and have all those be radius slightly and water wouldn't puddle, maybe that could improve function and clean up the deck. So we developed some tubs, and that's the 0.25. I was thinking of Noguchi and a womb and what it would feel like if you could like get in the, like a neonatal tank or something, you know. And then we just did a new one called Formworks because through the computer we started to be able to study how water, like duct work, doesn't necessarily have to be a big fat duct. It'd be a long, skinny plenum as long as you deliver the same amount of volume. So to slim it up even more, we created slimmer profiles to deliver water, and water actually is delivered the same volume and speed in a, in a different profile. And we worked on slump glass. Then um, I know your director, Mr. Anderson, is that his name? Maxwell. Uh, he was at the Whitney, and this was the, we, we, we were invited by Vasovsky with uh, uh, Richard Meyer and Gwathmi Siegel and Michael Graves and Todd Williams and a bunch of other people to a rug collection, and in the High Style show in 1987, this was the last piece in the Whitney show called High Styles of American Decorative Arts. It was uh, exploring the breaking up of the grid as postmodernism had kind of kicked in, and we worked on a series of rugs in the collection with them. And um, I thought, God, uh, I'm getting old and this digital media stuff is happening and how can I be a part of this new transition? And Condé Nast offered me uh, a job called The Architect's Eye in which I had to do my own photography and own writing, but I could write about almost anything every week was my obligation. So I thought I wanted to share the things I had learned, share the training I had and the things I would discover to try to spread the word of the importance of great integrated design. So if you go to Architectural Digest, the Architect's Eye at Architect Digest Google, you'll see me struggling. I'm going to try to wrap Dallas soon, too. Um, and this was one of the stories on Rio de Janeiro. And um, this was actually Brasilia, Oscar Niemeyer's work in Brasilia. So this was one of the stories called the Architect's Eye. These are all the buildings by Niemeyer. That's a band show. It's a very scary building because they got the military in there, and when you clap, it echoes. So it's very springtime for Hitler in there when they're all clapping, I have to say. <laughs> There's, you know, they have a lady who's president, and they have a lady guard up there. There's a tough broad on the second floor up there <laughs> protecting that, that lady and that thing. And then he, you know, Oscar, he died at 104 years old. He was a notorious womanizer, and most of his buildings look like breasts, I swear. <laughs> The president of uh, Brazil was Kubitschek when this was done, and he, he wanted to activate the densest part of Brazil, so he moved the capital from Rio under the Portuguese charter into the middle of the country. 
and built this somewhat questionable town now, which is a little bit of a utopian fantasy that doesn't really work because it's based on the automobile exclusively and not a pedestrian. Then I went out to Plano, Illinois to, in search of the Farnsworth House. And we, I was there on the hottest day of the year. It was uh, 100 degrees, and the windows were fogged up. And I thought, this is going to be a disaster. But it ended up being the most beautiful day because the condensation created a veil over it. And now the Farnsworth is using this for fundraising. And they're going to make postcards of these pictures because the, no one had ever thought that the air conditioning condensation might be a beautiful thing. <laughs> so it just depends how you look at everything. Then I went to Ronchamp, uh, Corbusier's masterpiece, which is a spectacular structure. I had to take all these pictures. This is part of my obligation every week. That's why I'm really a lot younger than I look. <laughs> it's a nun's hat, they call the building. And then uh, Princeton University is very interesting. It, for such a stodgy university, it has the most interesting collection of new buildings started in 1969, the Jadwin Gymnasium. Is a precursor. It's kind of Buckminster Fuller from the past, foreshadowing Frank Geary in the future. It's a super interesting structure we can all learn from. And this is Ralph Agnelli's beautiful Roman stadium there, and Yamasaki's structure. And God bless the Venturi's complexity and contradiction. They, their work is beautiful at the Princeton campus, I have to say. It works uh, so beautifully there. Gordon Wu Hall. That's Michael Graves' work there, which is beautiful. And Silvetti and Vignoli and the late Charlie Gwathmi at Wig Hall. Two classical buildings, and they had a big fire. So rather than fill it back in with tradition, he filled it back in with a kind of skeletal Corbusian composition. Frank Geary at Princeton. And you have a, 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 a Pay Cobb building here. This is Henry Cobb at Princeton exploring the bay windows of the traditional. And then I did a story on the Shard as it opened uh, Renzo Piano in London. Fantastic building, I have to say. And they take you up to the top, which is really scary because the whole building comes apart. And they get you on a closed floor where the windows are blurred and they have the names of the clouds. This is so you don't get nauseous and vomit or something. So <laughs> first you sort of blurry. It says cumulus numbus and whatever it is. And then you go up another flight, and there's a red core. And then you go up another flight, and then you start to see the windows. And then you're ready for the full explosion on top, where the building literally disintegrates, and you're hanging over the city. And this moment was very special, because the shard is pointing at Tower Bridge, like a sundial. And I thought that was an interesting moment there. So we've had a practice, our practice, this is a, uh, you know, all ages have interesting buildings. This was a Larkin Sanan by Ledoux. Now, Ledoux, I don't know if anybody are boned up in their French history, but one of the Louis had a mistress named Madame de Barry. And Madame de Barry was screwing this guy named Ledoux on the side. So he wanted to get the commission to do the Royal Salt Works because they were collecting taxes there. So he handed the plans to Madame de Barry who gave them to one of the Louis, and Louis said, I don't like that plan, I want another plan. And she got him this assignment of building the salt mines, where they collected taxes, which is a kind of plan unit development where workers and people live together. Right before the revolution, they, they sensed it was coming. And last month, Di just asked me to write about what was the most innovative building I'd ever seen. And I still think it's the Pantheon. It's over 2,000 years old. Nobody knows who designed it. It's the largest unreinforced concrete building in the world to this date. And it was saved because the church bought it uh, after Rome declined. And I'm working with Richard Meyer on a project. This is his favorite building. And I'm also working with Peter Bolin of the Apple stores in Gates' house. And it's his favorite building. And it's so interesting that we are modernists, but we celebrate the rigor and purity, and this is the only building I know with no windows that's more open than a glass box. 
just by its oculus. Thank you.